that he does plan to testify in this case. Of course, whether he shows up, we'll see. Is that a good idea? Uh, it's generally not a good idea for defendants to testify uh, in their own defense in criminal cases. Um, Trump has done this in civil cases, of course, very recently, including the New York Attorney General's civil business fraud trial, Eugene Carroll's uh, second trial, and those did not go well for him. In fact, I think uh, those efforts were counterproductive and probably made matters worse for him in front of the jury uh, uh, in the in the AG's case and uh, excuse me, in the jury in the Eugene Carroll case and the yep. judge in the AG's case. So it's, a, uh, it's not a good idea, but maybe he'll do it. It's such a great point based on that experience, which we saw play out just very recently. Robert, how could Trump's testimony, in your view, impact the jury? Yeah, Jim, thanks for having me. Well, look. If he's really getting buried by the evidence in the case, he may not have a choice personally. Uh, I don't think he ever serves himself well by testifying. He testified in the E. Jean Carroll. The jury lit him up for a huge verdict. Uh, and then in the AG's case, remember, one of the complaints he made is, oh, I should have had a jury. Now that he does have a jury, now that the king of continuance is finally going to have to face a jury, now he's saying that they can't be fair. You got to, you know, he's, he's going to have his work cut out for him. But, Jim, all he's got to do is find one. We all got to remember that. If he can get one juror that doesn't vote for, for uh, guilty, then he's won. Ankush, uh, Trump failed tonight in yet another attempt to delay the trial, uh, in this case over pre-trial publicity. But you did hear Paula's reporting there, more challenges from the president's legal team expected next week. Some of that, as she explained, setting up for a possible appeal. But, but I wonder, is there anything you can think of that Trump's team could do now to stop this case from moving forward, uh, even after it begins on Monday? Nothing that would work or nothing that mm -hmm. should work. Um, this trial should proceed uh, on Monday and go forward. Uh, but of course, Trump and his lawyers often try uh, highly unusual uh, uh, things, including all of the efforts this week to try to prevent this trial from going forward. Several of them were highly un unusual and new to me. They all flopped. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if he tries more of that, uh, him and his lawyers, maybe even going to the Supreme Court after the trial has begun. I wouldn't expect that to work, um, but I also uh, wouldn't be surprised if they keep doing it. Robert, so Monday, Trump, he's going to be face to face with these potential jurors, jurors in that courtroom. He'll be there for jury selection. I wonder how could that impact what the potential jurors say, how they behave? I wonder if you've seen uh, a parallel to this that might give us a sense of that. Yeah, well, he's the most famous person in the world. And when you've come face to face with somebody that's got that kind of charisma, that kind of power, it tends to be intimidating, it tends to be shocking, it tends to be exciting. But here's the thing, Jim. As long as the judge says to the jurors, look, we don't want you to tell us what you think we want to hear. Just tell us how you honestly think and feel about this case, this defendant. That's the best chance that this judge is going to have for getting a fair jury. But make no mistake about it. Uh, he's going to lose the vast majority of the jurors, uh, either for hardship trial. They just can't serve yeah. that long or because they've already formed an opinion about uh, president or uh, former President Trump or the case. So he's going to go through a bunch of jurors. Uh, we'll know by the end of Monday what the pace looks like and how long mm. it'll take to pick this jury. Uh, that's a great point. We'll be watching for that first day. Uh, Robert Ankush, thanks so much to both of you. And out front now, former Republican Congressman Ken Buck of Colorado. He just retired. Courtroom and being um, ar not arraigned, but him facing jury selection like any other citizen. Your thoughts? Yeah, and I think that's important, Joy, to point out, because if you look at the style of the case, and the style is the name, it's the people of New York, right, versus Donald J. Trump, he doesn't get the benefit of President Trump. As we know, annoyingly, his lawyers consistently refer to him as President Trump in legal filings and when they speak about him in court. But it is the humbling moment when he has to sit at counsel's table, not by choice, but by law and required procedure, when he is referred to as criminal defendant Donald Trump, that the playing field is truly leveled. And that is when accountability comes a knocking and hard because the voir dire process, the jury selection process, all the way to the verdict being rendered against him is something that affects thousands of Americans on a daily basis. And so regardless of how much he wants to have all hell break loose outside, there will be a 
silence that will be happening in that courtroom because Donald Trump will not be in the driver's seat. Judge Juan Mershan will be controlling his courtroom as he does. And Donald Trump will not have any free reign to act out when he's in court. And he will have to, again, sit humbly and quietly while the judicial system does its work. Yeah, something he's not used to doing. And Glenn, I mean, we've just been covering, obviously, the death of O.J. Simpson. You know, that was sort of a monumental trial of the century in the 21st century. What do you think that we in the media should have learned from from that spectacle that uh, I remember, I, I, I was telling Chris Hayes the other day, I was 25 years old on, on uh, maternity leave. So I watched the trial like I, I felt like I was the 13th member of the jury. Um, but what do you think that we in the media should learn from that coverage of spectacle? Because the way in which Trump is not like every other American is the same way OJ was not like every other American. He's a celebrity. And on top of that, he's a former president. What should we learn as what should we think about as we're watching that spectacle? You know, I, I think we should we should focus on the fact that the rule of law matters. The rule of law is one of the things that makes this country great, that makes us a civilized people. And, and I firmly believe we're in a really important moment because our nation will be stronger for a former president of the United States who committed all kinds of crimes. He's indicted 88 times over the evidence in my assessment, even that's just been publicly reported is overwhelming. Um, and our nation will be stronger once our lived experience is that even a former president of the United States can be put through a fair judicial process and a jury of his peers, a jury of ordinary citizens will be in a position to decide whether the admissible evidence proves his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I believe he'll be held accountable. I believe he'll be convicted. But one way or another, our nation will come out the other side of this so much stronger for just having gone through the exercise of putting a criminal former president on trial. Yeah. And, you know, Bobby, I, you know, it, I wanted to bring you and I know you've written a lot about this because I think it is a normalizing thing. I think Americans sometimes want exceptionalism so badly that they forget we're part of the world, you know, and I, and I, I, I thought of Ber uh, Berlusconi uh, because, you know, you, Rula Jabril, who you and I both know very well, who's a great journalist and has done a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of her journalism in Italy. You know, she's the one who first told me, you know, Trump is America's Berlusconi, very similar sort of larger than life media kind of character. And, and his, his that was a humbling moment for one one of the most powerful men ever in Italy's history. It, what does it say to you, just as someone who, who's covered the international sort of media world and international politics, that Donald Trump is going to meet the same kind of system of justice that he had to? Well, it is. A, it, it would be a terrific ad advertisement for American democracy yeah. if, uh, when you put the president on former president on trial, we're talking about how it will be perceived in this country, how New Yorkers will see it how his, his supporters will see it, but I'm thinking of how the world will see it. And mm -hmm. the world will see American democracy, which we like to preach to the rest of the world. The world will see American democracy, Amer the American justice system in action. And I think the world will welcome that. Uh, you talk of Berlusconi, Jacques Chirac of France uh, was convicted. Uh, three presidents in a row in Brazil, uh, three presidents in South Korea. Mm -hmm. These are not sort of, uh, to use a slightly uh, uh, unpopular phrase, these are not banana republics. These are thriving democracies. And it's a good thing for a democracy to show everybody within the country, and because we are United States, to show the wider world that in a democracy, the systems of justice work independently from the political process. I, I mean what do you think the former president's trying to basically uh, change the jury selection process at this point? Well, I think he's trying to do is find a basis in the appeal to say that he's not getting a fair jury. So he's sort of trying to get f gather d data, as Kara said. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's planning for a potential conviction here because what he's trying to say is that I want to understand all the different bases by which these jurors could perhaps not be fair to me and not be impartial. And I want to parse it out. So if I want to highlight specific things to the appellate court, I'm able to have that information from the trial court to send up. He's preparing, mm -hmm. like a good lawyer should, his, his legal team here, preparing for the potential data that he's either convicted and wants to challenge this process, or if he wants to seek some kind of uh, interlocutor interlocutory appeal mm -hmm. now, meaning he wants to challenge a goal up uh, right now in the middle, that mm -hmm. he has the opportunity to do so. Karen, do you actually think it's likely he would testify? Look, 
he thinks he's his best spokes. So folks, what you just saw there is old Donnie making a bunch of mistakes and also the judge making a big move to really let the evidence speak for itself, right? There's always a, a sense that a judge has a, a, a lot of discretion. You know, in a criminal trial, ultimately, the 12 men and women of the jury make the decision. In a civil case, there are sometimes juries, sometimes not. There are always a jury, at least in the United States, at least you can request a jury in a criminal case, right? And as such, they make a lot of the decisions, but the judge, in terms of evidence that comes in and evidence that stays out, plays a big role. And as noted there, Donald Trump providing a lot of the evidence against himself, at least right now when he says he wants to testify. And also, as noted there, when the evidence really starts flowing in, it's going to doom him. Because a lot of people are worried about some of the stuff being hearsay and people not trusting Michael Cohen, even though I trust Michael Cohen, at least I do now. Everything he's saying is backed up by the facts and by the facts that Donald Trump signed a check. It's all there in black and white. And Donald right now is doomed. And if he had any chance of surviving, what he's done tonight and the decisions by the judge tonight change everything.